Okay, everybody, are we ready to kick off the next session? Down at the back. Right, thank you very much, everybody, for um, making it to the, 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 the before lunch session. Um, I just want to um, thank our sponsors, so we are Wiley, uh, for our, our nice break we've just had. That was very, very kind of them. And, um, and I'll be doing a lunch um, announcement at the end of this session as well. So the way we're going to run this is I'll do a general introduction and then we'll have our, our two speakers in quick succession um, and then we'll do questions at the end. So, um, I just wanted to uh, give a bit of background context of, of um, how research data and scholarly communication have, have danced the dance um, a little bit over the last decade or so. Um, because as you'll be aware, research data has only recently entered the mainstream of scholarly public communication. And um, so personally for me, um, it was when ClimateGate hit at the end of 2009 with the, the big email um, hack leak that, that took place at the University of East Anglia. And, and suddenly, as a publisher of um, Earth and Environmental Sciences, um, I had editors, societies, authors, reviewers, you know, clamouring for, for answers, if you like, for, for help, for guidance, and for you know, some, some sort of order that, was, that, um, that could be um, you know, responded to with the chaos that they, that they potentially saw. Um, they wanted you know, ethical support, and they wanted technical support. Um, and at that time, we, we hadn't been thinking about it. Um, if you like, research data wasn't something that, as a, as a publisher, we'd really been dealing with. Um, so I think over you know, since then, over the last sort of decade or so, I mean, there's been a you know an increasing awareness that the publisher skill sets, and also the people that do publishing, um, you need to be changed, you need to be expanded. And um, I'm pleased to say that, that that's where our, our two next speakers have come from. Um, they're both you know very experienced information specialists. Um, they're also very new to publishing, so they've still got, if you like, you know something to bring from from outside. I think we're going to be really you know, privileged to hear. I'm looking forward to this. So first of all, um, we'll have Rebecca Grant, who's now at Spring in Nature. Um, and she's actually uh, a data archivist and a, a trained open data instructor at the Open Data Institute. And a part-time PhD student. And in her spare time, you work for Spring in Nature. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and then we'll have Jean Shipman, who for the vast majority of her career has actually been a, a senior medical um, sciences librarian, as well as she mentioned it, a co-editor of several books, which hopefully Mark will put up you know, later on and give people a chance to buy later. Um, and that since then, you know, more recently though, she's joined Elsevier as a, as a senior global library relations um, executive. So we'll have both the, our speakers and then we'll have some Q&As at the end and I hope everybody enjoys it. Okay. Uh, so my name is Rebecca Grant, I'm Research Data Manager at Springer Nature as part of the data publishing team there um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the projects and initiatives that we've been involved with around supporting data sharing and also some of the impacts of those. Um, so probably I didn't need to include this slide but if you don't know who Springer Nature are, we're um, one of the leading academic publishers, um, publishing brands including Springer, Nature, uh, BMC, Paul Gray Macmillan. Okay. Um, so, first off, I wanted to give a little bit of context in case people aren't overly familiar with the area, which is why are we talking about data sharing at all, and why as a publisher are we thinking about data sharing? Um, I'm sure, or I would assume that most of you have heard about the um, idea of a reproducibility crisis in science, so the idea that um, a lot of the science that's being done simply can't be reproduced and this costs us money. Um, and also um, it leads to questions around the validity of how science is done if you can't reproduce it. So um, there was a survey that we published in Nature a couple of years ago where we asked researchers whether they believed there was this crisis of reproducibility, so more than half think that there is a crisis. Um, we also asked researchers whether they felt that they could reproduce their own experiments if they were asked to and more than half felt that they couldn't and more than 70% of researchers think they wouldn't be able to reproduce um, somebody else's experiment. We also undertook a smaller uh, study in uh, nature genetics, so we were just looking at 18 papers there, um, and only two of those could be fully reproduced, um, six could be partially reproduced, and 10 couldn't re reproduce at all. 
And one of the findings of that study was that the main reason for this was that the data weren't shared, or if they were shared, um, there wasn't enough information with the data to allow that study to be reproduced. So um, what are we doing about this as Bringer Nature? Uh, one of the initiatives that I work on is this rollout of standard research data policies. So since 2016, we've been standard standardizing the data policies that our journals have. Um, at the moment, we have a framework of four different policy types. So they range from the type one policy, which is quite liberal, so it really encourages data sharing, nothing is mandated. Um, and we go all the way up to a type four policy where you can't publish in that journal unless you've shared your data in a repository. And the reason there are four types is to address um, disciplinary differences in data sharing. So I'm from a humanities background. Um, a lot of researchers in the humanities wouldn't be familiar with data sharing. Um, so a lot of humanities journals would have this type one policy, whereas in life sci sciences, it's much more common practice. So you'll see the journals that have the really strict policies tend to be in the life science areas. And at the moment, um, around 60% of our journals have a policy. Part of my role is to encourage journals to keep um, taking up a policy if they don't have one. Um, and across all the policy types, even though the type one and type two don't mandate researchers to do anything. Uh, we do have common recommendations for them. So we would always recommend that researchers are putting their data in a repository. So don't upload it as supplementary material with your paper. Uh, we always would allow citations of data to be added to reference lists. Um, and we also provide a help desk that I'll talk a bit more about. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting to look at what this looks like across the journals. So this is a breakdown of which, how many journals have each policy type. So you can see um, the biggest proportion is actually this type one that's just telling researchers uh, we encourage you to do this but it's not required. Um, then we have 528 type two at the moment, 405 type three. These are all, um, not all, but all of the nature journals and all of the BMC journals would have this type. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about what that means. But you can see the, the really tiny part of the wedge, which is six journals, um, are the journals that have the type four. So that's the journals that require you to deposit your data in a repository or you can't publish. Um, so just thinking a bit more about what the impact of having this kind of policy would be. Um, this is a study we did in 2017. Um, so Nature had announced that they were um, basically um, adopting a type three data policy. So they were gonna start requiring, requiring their authors to include a data availability statement when they publish. Um, so we wanted to do um, a bit of an analysis of what the impact of that is. So if you tell researchers, they have to tell you where they're sharing their data, what do they say? And also what's the impact on editorial staff of having a policy like this? Um, so we did publish a paper on this in the uh, International Journal of Digital Curation. So if you're super interested, um, there's a lot more information and the data set is published too. Um, but just to explain what we mean by data avail availability statement, um, it is what it sounds like really. So it's just a section of the published paper where the author is asked to explain how their data can be accessed. And um, there are kind of common ways that authors tend to do this. So we, we provide templates to authors, but it's basically free text. They can describe it any way they want to. But what we see most often is authors saying, uh, my data is available in a repository and this is where you'll find it. Um, some people would say, um, I'll give it to you, to you on reasonable request. So, and that is a valid way of data sharing. So we will allow them to say that. Um, and finally, the other one that you see quite commonly is I've uploaded it as supplementary material. So the final two we don't encourage, but we do allow authors to continue to do that. Um, so I've just I've picked a couple of the stats from the analysis we did. Um, this was uh, the first batch of journals that we um, uh, studied. We asked the editors to capture what kind of extra time it was taking them to deal with these papers now that there was this additional mandatory aspect. So you can see um, the average minutes um, across all of those journals was around 10 of editorial time. So that's editorial checks of what people were putting in that section. Um, and then we also asked um, what kind of copy edit time it was taking. We found uh, around five minutes per paper. Um, the next thing we did was we were interested in seeing, okay, uh, authors have been told they have to report where they're sharing their data. How are, what, how are they doing it? So we coded each of the statements across these journals according to four types. These, these are not reflecting the policy types. Unfortunately, the codes have the same name. So the type one would say the data is available on request. The type two was that it was uploaded as supplementary material. The type three, uh, that it was in a repository. And then type four is a really nature specific way of data sharing called um, figure source data. So not, not many had that. Um, so we were interested in seeing um, 
what methods authors were using to share their data, and we, we've published um, that data set as well. What I've um, pulled out here is how much time it took for editors to deal with these papers, depending on what type of data sharing method the author had chosen. So you can see the type three, which is where they had chosen to share in a repository, which we were, would encourage them to do, that took by far the most editorial time to check, because there can often be a lot of non-standard text in there, um, and they don't necessarily have all their data in one place, so it can be quite long um, when you read them. Um, so a couple of the findings from this study. Um, firstly, um, it, it does increase manuscript processing time. So if you add something new to a manuscript and it's mandatory, someone needs to check it. Can you back in? No. <coughs> um, but the benefits outweigh the, um, the issues of the increased processing time. So this is author behavior we want to encourage and we acknowledge that it takes time, but we think that it's worth the extra time to do it. Um, we also found that the processing time is most increased when authors share in repositories, um, but these are the statements that have the most positive impact. So when you come to look for someone's data, your ideal situation is that it's in a repository, so we want to encourage authors to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so I also wanted to draw your attention to um, a white paper we published last year, so this was based on um, a survey we did of nearly 8,000 re researchers internationally. Um, and we've published that white paper online, but also the data set. So if you click through that link into Figshare, you'll find the whole underlying data set if you want to do your own analysis of it, that's available as well. Um, and again, I've just picked out some of the stats that I thought were interesting. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's a really long report, but there's lots of, it's, there's quite rich information in it if there's something else you're interested in finding. Um, so one of the things we asked researchers was, how are you sharing your data? So if you're sharing it, are you sharing it privately? So peer to peer, maybe you're sending it by email, um, or are you sharing it publicly? So you can see um, the majority of the people that we'd asked had used both methods, so privately and publicly. Only 2% only ever shared their data publicly. So that would be in a repository, um, supplementary information, um, or on their own website. So. Um, my box has moved down slightly, unfortunately, but what I was trying to draw attention to was that out of all these people we asked, only 25% had said that they were using a uh, repository or data archive. So that's what we want to encourage. Sorry. Um, and then I also just pulled out the global levels of data sharing, so you can see Polish researchers share most often. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we also asked researchers how important it was that people could find their data to reuse it. And you can see, unsurprisingly, it's people in life sciences, biological sciences, who report that they're most interested in this. And there's a much bigger culture of data sharing there. So where we have other sciences, that would include social sciences and humanities. And you can see there's less of a drive to share data for those people. Um, and then this is the one that I think is most interesting. Um, this is uh, what the challenges were that researchers found. So um, we asked people, like, are you interested in doing this? How do you do it? But then also tell us what you find challenging about it. And it, it might be kind of hard to read at the back, but what people reported most commonly was that they weren't sure about copyright and licensing, and they didn't know what repository they were supposed to be using, and they just didn't know how to organize the data in a way that's useful. So <coughs> oh, I'm really sorry about my cough. Um, you can see that the things they're reporting are really practical, so that basically they're saying, um, okay, this is important to me, I want to do it, but I, I genuinely don't know how, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing when you ask me to do this. Um, so one of the ways that we've addressed this uh, challenge, and also to kind of support uh, authors who are now encountering data policies at our journals, is providing a help desk. So this is available to any author uh, at our journals, it's actually available to anyone who has a question about research data sharing. So. We get questions from editors as well, and librarians, and um, data repository people. Um, so, but most commonly, the questions are from authors about how do they share in repositories. So it's um, the data publishing team that responds to queries. We answer within two business days if you want to ask us a question. <coughs> and um, I also pulled out some stats on what kind of things were being asked. So this is 2018, but it's actually not to the end of the year. So we had more questions than this. But you can see that the main thing people are asking us about is repositories. Where do they deposit their data? How do they do it? Um, so we, we do get asked quite technical questions about like, OK, I want to use this repository, but what am I supposed to do next? Um, and then the second most common query is around policy compliance. So 
Um, often those things overlap somewhat, but it's usually people saying, I've seen that there's policy at this journal, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do, could you help me with it, could you explain? Um, and then I just wanted to draw attention to another initiative that we're working on at the moment, which is research data support. So the research data help desk provides advice and guidance. If you're being asked to do something and you don't know how to do it, we will give you as much assistance as we can. Research data support is more of a hands-on service. So this is providing actual data curation for um, researchers. So if you would like to share your data in a repository, you feel like you don't know how to do it, you can send the data to our curation team and we will do that curation and publishing for you. And so just to show you what that looks like in practice, um, this is a data set that I worked on myself uh, about a year ago. Uh, it was sent to us as an Excel spreadsheet. I don't know where this researcher was storing it, possibly on his desktop, maybe somewhere else. Um, but obviously the, the file title, it actually is a meaningful ti file title, but I'd say most people wouldn't be able to interpret what it means. Um, there's no metadata to accompany it. There's no way for anyone to find this except this researcher himself. So he sent it to us. Um, and we went through the process that we go through for every data set that's sent to us, so we undertake a series of checks. Um, we don't look, deal with sensitive human data, but we'll provide advice if people want to share that data and don't know how. Um, we also wouldn't work with any data that, that should be in a community repository, so a lot of um, research disciplines, particularly again in the life sciences, would have a community repository that is commonly used by everyone in that discipline, so things like um, genomics, for example, they would have standard repositories, so we won't work with that data. We would send them to the repository that they should be using. Um, so we undertake these checks and then we will begin curation if the data are suitable. Um, so I won't go through the whole process, but this is the output of the service. So um, we've produced like a catalogue record for this data set. Basically, it's got a meaningful title explaining what is in it. It's published in our uh, Springer Nature Figshare repository and all of that descriptive information around the data set that helps it be understood and found. That's not the abstract for the paper, so that's written completely from scratch and relates only to that data set. So it's describing what the experiment was and what someone will find if they um, download this file. And then that is connected to their published paper that was published in, um, I think it was BMC Ecology. Um, oh, and we also provide them with feedback. So what we don't do as part of this service or via the help desk is to work directly with someone's data file. So we don't open the spreadsheet and look at it and say like, oh, I, I think the variable there has the wrong header. But we will give feedback, so we're not gonna edit for them. Um, but if we see something that would, uh, the data set would benefit from changing, we will recommend that they do that. Um, and something else I wanted to briefly touch on is another pilot that we're working on. So uh, I'm part of the team that is working on this pilot, uh, but I'm not leading it. So if you have really in-depth questions about it, I will do my best to answer. Um, but we're piloting on one journal, which is BMC Microbiology, um, to provide open data badges to authors where they have chosen to share their data in a repository. So what we're trying to assess with this is does this have any impact on um, author sharing data? So if you are incentivized in some way to share your data openly in a repository and you get a badge that other people can see and they can access your data through it, does that encourage people to share their data? And we also want to see, does it encourage reader engagement? So if you find an article that has an open data badge, are you more interested in opening the data, downloading the article? Um, and finally, we're also interested in um, what are the benefits or the costs to the publisher in providing this? So if no one is interested in open data badges, we will not continue to do it because it comes at quite um, a time cost in terms of us assessing these papers. Uh, so this is, um, it's not exactly what it looks like. This is what we thought it was gonna look like, but basically you'll see at the top of a published paper that has open data, it does have a little badge icon. You can click through and you'll see the evidence. So why, why is this paper um, getting awarded an open data badge? And you can access the data um, when you click through. We have a much more in-depth um, blog post on the aims of this project that I've included the link for if you're interested. Um, okay, so to wrap up. Um, so, I think uh, I've talked about a lot of different things that we're doing um, in terms of data publishing and maybe at quite a surface level, so I'm totally happy to answer questions about any of those projects. Um, but just thinking about why we're doing this and what the impacts are, like we do want to encourage um, more reproducible, reliable research being published. and. Um, 
not only that, but also that researchers get recognition for doing that. So things like encouraging researchers to share their data openly, but also to um, encourage the citation of data. So if you are sharing data openly, you get some kind of credit, you'll see it in your reference list. Um, but we've also seen that um, like since rolling out the uh, policies and starting to work with authors in terms of supporting them to share their data and then undertaking this survey, um, there's still uh, more maybe support that needs to happen. So you, I, I think you can't just apply a policy that requires um, an author to share data and not provide any support because they are telling us that they can't do it. So. Like some researchers do a really great job and are very familiar with this, um, but from the survey that we've undertaken, that's not the case for everyone. And certainly my experience of providing help via the help desk, um, not everyone is clear on exactly what they're being asked to do. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can provide support. So the, the way that we are providing support is through providing advice and assistance. We can provide hands-on curation if that's what you would prefer. And then we're also trying to incentivize and reward people who are already doing a good job. So does that have an impact? Um, and also I think that uh, coming back to the idea of rolling out policies, um, there's one side of it which is that authors might need support, maybe they aren't ready for data sharing or you will need to assist them. But on the publisher side, you also need to make sure that you're enforcing. So there's absolutely no point in having a policy with a mandatory requirement if no one's gonna check that um, something was done or was not done. Um, and then you also need to know what you'll do if, if the author hasn't done what you've asked them to. Um, and finally, I think um, if you're going to provide this kind of practical, practical support, so to have a policy in place, to uh, commit to assist researchers in sharing their data, you have to have the skills. So we have a data publishing team um, and all of us, I think, well, most of us have more of a data sharing background than a publishing background and um, we also have quite a range of disciplinary expertise and I think that's really crucial um, if you want to provide this kind of support uh, to researchers. Um, okay, so uh, that email address, the research data, is our help desk. So if you want to contact the team generally, that's the best way to do it. And my email address is there too. And then we also have a research data sharing community um, that's pretty active. Uh, so that is the researchdata.springernature.com. So I would encourage you to join if you're interested. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm um, Jean Chipman. Uh, VP for Global Library Relations for Elsevier, but prior to that, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was a medical library director at University of Utah. And I can say the first thing that someone asked me at Elsevier before I even started was, what do you as a librarian need to be successful in the future? I have to say, no one in my entire 37-year career had ever asked me that question. So I didn't have to think long and hard because I knew big data was on the horizon. And I said, I think I need to get some skills in big data in order to direct this library. Because we were very involved with the Office of Research. We were very involved with the whole life cycle of research. We had even come up with a Ask Myra kind of situation where it was um, my research assistant. So any part of your persona as a researcher, junior, senior, whatever, you could plug into this life cycle and be able to connect with the Office of Research and get forms, get policies, whatever related. So with that in mind, I was thinking, what can I do as a past librarian and helping the future of all librarians um, in the world? And with this idea of what I needed, we put together a librarian-led research data management academy. And that's what I'm gonna share the progress today with you. So the first thing we said, other than my thinking, there was a need for the academy. How do we ensure that there is such a need? So we did a quite a bit of research on it. We did a needs assessment, and we also did an inventory of what training was already out there. As we all know, there's programs, lots of um, schools of library science and information science are starting to teach this. So what would make our academy unique? And then why librarians? Um, and I keep saying, why not librarians? You know, I, I uh, have to say, 37 years, I've seen a lot of transition of roles of librarians. I started before the PC, and so now you can only envision what 
I think we're going to see in the next even 20 years with big data. But librarians are resilient, and right? librarians are also trainable and also train many others. So I think that if not librarians, then who could better serve this role? And I couldn't come up with that. Because we do have transferable organizing skills. We've cataloged and uh, organized books and journals for years and years. A lot of those skills, the describability of the content, the de making it discoverable, making it retrievable, usable, helping to disseminate uh, results, that's all in our skill uh, wheelhouse. So why not transfer all this information to data? And I have to say, I thank Christine um, for her talk earlier about librarians not being just supporters of researchers, but now partners of researchers. And I think by infusing ourselves with all these skills, we can be true partners in research labs. And we are looking at models, uh, many of you probably have heard about the informationist, where you embed a librarian with skills that are not only information skills, but subject specific knowledge. So that could be research data, it could be um, education data, clinical data. But in this case, I could see us becoming even more research uh, informationists. We also are some, a lot of times um, working with our offices of research and compliance and also helping faculty to measure their impact for their portfolio when they go up for promotion and tenure. And I think that we also can be trainers of a lot of our researchers about FAIR principles so that they understand what they're being asked to do. And Rebecca, you made a good point of, of why even in your slide you had one person or many people saying they need research data support. So thank you for that, <laughs> that uh, evidence as well. So I think um, everybody really can learn about research data management, but I really wanted librarians to be uh, a key player in this. So I was talking to Elaine Martin, who is at Harvard Catway Medical Library. She and I worked as directors of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine in two different regional offices. And she had been putting together quite a series of boot camps for the network members um, over the years. So I asked her, I said, where are you with training and where are you thinking? And she said, well, actually, I just got a MOOC uh, formulated through funding from NIH to create a foundational course. That MOOC now has a thousand students uh, participating in it. But she said, I still feel like I haven't addressed a practicing librarian someone who can't get away from their day-to-day -day work, needs to be learning on the side, but needs to really be beefing up their skills in this area. So what, what are you thinking? And I said, well, I'm thinking if we could help support you with your team that she had formed, and the members of the team are listed here. They're from um, Tufts University, Northeastern, um, Harvard, both regular library and the medical library, and also um, the pharmacy school in Boston and Simmons University. She said, I have this team that we've been looking for funding. If you can provide funding, we can do the work. And I thought, how beautiful. And in, in the US, we have Reese's peanut butter cups. So I say the peanut butter met the chocolate at that point in time. So we together had blended um, a research data management academy. And with Simmons University, they're supporting us with providing credit for this. Um, there'll be CE credit and certification and if you take all the components of it. So the idea has been born. So now what we did was the evidence to support this. So we did a needs assessment for about nine months, starting in April of 18. We had 19 questions that we posed on Library Connect. And yes, we, it's not a scientific study. I won't go say it is by any means, but we got about 240 responses. And I think what was really, really fun was the 600, over 600 question um, open answer questions that were given. And we tabulated those to be able to look for themes about what people really needed. So here are three questions. Um, how did you, how likely would you be to participate in a training program? And you can see the top is very likely. Um, and it goes further down. So that was one of the key questions that said that we were on the right track. And then we asked, what role or do you want a more formal role with research data management in your institution? And again, the majority said yes, they would love that. And then we said, and I have to get closer, um, 
what challenges does your institution have in offering a research data management service? And the key thing was getting people informed about the service and also helping um, to scale it up and kind of make it uh, something that they could sustain. So the needs definitely were indicated, but we wanted to also look at scanning um, competencies. So we went through over 44 job descriptions, and I would say in the medical library world, this is the key job um, that's being recruited for right now. Any kind of data visualization, data representation, data management, data archivist, um, we really are hiring a lot of people in this area. So we looked at the key um, competencies, and I just noticed today we invented a new word called infrastructure. Uh, I think that was infrastructure um, that was a theme and just picked up. But as you can see, analytics is huge, infrastructure is huge, uh, data management plans, metadata, and data science were key competencies required. As I mentioned, we were aware there are a lot of training opportunities already available, so we went through and cataloged or themed what training opportunities exist, looking at MOOCs, webinars, workshops, and then we also went so far as to look at data uh, science curriculum in different universities. So um, all the results of our studies are freely available at, open at that URL it's on GitHub. So. That was a key uh, thing that we wanted this training to be, was open and usable by anybody. So all that we're developing will be freely available to those um, that want to take the courses or units. And if you want CE credit, there will be a small fee for that that will go to Simmons University. But we also weren't sure what was happening in library schools and information schools at the time. So we surveyed, sent out a survey um, to all the educators, and we only got six responses, which I think is an indicator that we still have quite a ways to go with formal curriculum development in this area. But for us, it was good news because we did see the, still a gap existed that we could fulfill. So with the information, we are working on a curriculum. Um, the team is, has met many times, and it's just a fun-paced group. Um, Boston area has been a leader in kind of library support for data, so we have a lot of people with expertise in this area that's willing to share it with others. Uh, Simmons University was very eager to reinvigorate their CE program, so this will be the kickoff for that. And also we um, will be getting, um, hopefully, the CE credit portion figured out because we don't want people to have to register for this and identify themselves, but if they want credit, they will have to. So we're, we're kind of working through all those um, details at this point. We do hope that this will be ready September, October of 2019, and we are working madly with Simmons Online actually to help do the instructional design for it. So there'll be a consistent look, feel, and everything to the probably eight units. So if you want to know more about it, um, I can say that we can keep continuing to um, put updates in Library Connect, and I've supplied the URL there. We do have the GitHub site that has all the uh, inventory and training uh, that we identified through competencies and things available on that GitHub site. You can contact any of the partners I've mentioned. Um, we're going around the circuit this year and giving a lot of uh, talks about this, and also feel free to email me and is this just for librarians? While it's targeted mainly for them, there's really coursework in this um, modules that will be applicable for just anybody, really. Researchers, students, publisher employees, vendor employees, and anyone who speaks English. This will be available across the globe. And in time, we hope to be able to translate it as well. So I wanted to give you an overview of the eight uh, units we are thinking of right now. There's a foundational course, just to give you an overview of everything. Um, navigating the research data culture. That was a need that came up that people needed to know more what happens in research labs and what happens um, so that they can help uh, partner with them. And also marketing it service to their administrators. 
many um, people told us, well, I, when I approached my library director about this, they're like, oh, I can't, I can't see it. How are we going to sustain it? How are we going to scale it? How are we going to fund it? And I was guilty myself of that. So this is um, also a story that directors then would say to us, why go to the university administration? And they also tell me, well, why library? Why this? Why? How can you help? So one of the units will be how to market um, this program to your administrators, whoever they may be. Um, how to uh, manage a data service and start one in a health science or in a regular uh, library. So that's another course. Uh, overview of platforms and tools, including coding tools and um, management tools, and specifically courses work on Python and Jupyter Notebook. So those are the thoughts right now. We are, uh, like I said, madly working as teams to develop these units, and they will be on probably a learning management system like Canvas and be on a website um, that will be developed. It'll be very, we're very particular about not branding it with one you know, institution's brand. So even my slides today are very generic, if you notice. Um, we do feel this is a unique partnership between librarians, uh, publisher, and a library school. So we're very thrilled to be able to offer this to the village and um, because the village is putting it together. And I think the other key um, aspect of this that's really vital is that it's peer-to-peer -peer instruction. So librarians are training other librarians um, on this whole skill set that they have experience with. So with that, I think I'll go ahead and end and let us have questions. So. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much to both our speakers. I think you've given a really good, you know, um, very sort of symbiotic um, couple of talks here on research data and, and how it impacts on scholarly communication. Um, are there any questions? Oh, you know, don't all rush at once. Yeah, we've got one there. Hi, Anna Clements, University of St Andrews. Thank you both. Very interesting um, topics. I wanted to ask um, first speaker about your policy um, of whether you recommend or not that researchers deposit their data in the institutional data repositories. Now, I know you have an, uh, an FAQ which says you don't list those in your recommended ones, but you don't seem to have any preliminary uh, discussion about suggesting the researchers check with their institutions. Yeah, that's true. Um, so we don't have a, so we maintain a list of recommended repositories that's linked from uh, the policy text only for uh, life sciences journals. Uh, so the recommended repository list that we link to um, includes those community disciplinary repositories that I spoke about. So we're directing people who should be uh, depositing into a community repository to find the correct community repository. We don't mention institutional repositories or generalist repositories for anyone who doesn't need to go to one of those community-based repositories. Um, we get the same question about our help desk. So if a researcher approached us saying, I don't know how to comply with this policy, what repository should I use? Um, if we can tell which institution they're from, which usually we can't, and we know that there's a, so usually we would check is there a repository available, we will recommend that they use them. We have no um, policy against using an institutional repository if it, the data shouldn't be somewhere else, so we definitely wouldn't um, uh, not recommend an institutional repository is used. We just don't list them on that repository list because they're not applicable to most people. Hello. Yeah, we have had examples. Um, that um, our institutional repository isn't uh, compliant or isn't sufficient. So we've had to go back and say, yes, it is, because we mint DOIs, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's something you should look at. OK, so an author was told by an editor that depositing their data in an institutional repository wasn't sufficient? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, I haven't heard of that before, but maybe I'll talk to you a bit more about it later. Yeah, that will be good. <laughs> Thank you. OK, <laughs> okay next. Um, so we've got one in the middle here. It's a problem with the microphone. Okay. 
Um, mine was actually more of a comment, and uh, it was to Jean. My name's Lou Peck, and um, I'm writing an article at the moment about some recent research that I've done for library roles. And it's interesting because I, I'm interested to see what the continued adoption is of this program because I found from my research that there is um, librarians are facing continued massive pressures in all the things that they do and libraries are needing to demonstrate ROI themselves and been treating as business units and I've seen a movement through the research that I did that libraries are recruiting non-librarians to do specific skill sets so they are recruiting people with marketing experience and from publishing industries as well so I'm just kind of I'm interested to see how the adoption goes of your program from the research that I've done recently and what I'm seeing I'm going to look forward to that too. I, I really feel strongly that people do want um, support and help with this, but I will um, be eager to see if librarians are going to step up and, and participate and get the skills. Those that have already worked, there's a, a special interest group within the Medical Library Association, and they are very close knit because they do share information with each other about how they're doing certain program um, at their institutions. And we're hoping actually to have a forum that will be part of the academy too, where people can share ideas and continue to work together on developing what services could be potentially of benefit to researchers. Because it's hard because they have to be everything for all. They see, have to, yeah. I mean. So it's like another thing that librarians have to do. It is, but um, I'm hoping in time that we can free up time with things that we are currently doing, like collection, to be able to do more uh, research support. And I also um, do believe that researchers are looking to the experts that they've used in the past for helping to disseminate the information to be able to help them manage the information throughout the whole process. And the earlier you get someone in to help them evaluate their data, so they know how to describe it and be able to um, record it from the start instead of having to fix the data at the end. I think we'll, it'll be better for everyone too. But, but I, um, the National Library of Medicine in the U.S. has actually funded some grants for this informationist model that I mentioned where a research um, unit had to say, yes, we will adopt a librarian for a period of time that the funding covered to just see what influence that librarian knowledge would have on the outcome of the research lab. And they're writing up those results, I think, now. They had two rounds of them, and I think they're looking at whether they should fund a third. But um, that helped us to investigate a little bit, too, what should be done. OK, so we've got one at the front, and then one that, uh, in the middle on the, on the side there. Yeah. Um, Anthony Watkinson. Uh, cyber research. Yes, I do know Fiona. I'm the one at the front there. Because <laughs> I sit here. No, I have. <laughs> um, the, no, I just wanted to say quickly, uh, we're doing, uh, cyber research has been doing three years of longitudinal study of early career researchers, and we've asked questions about data. Amazing. It's improved a bit, but they didn't, they were leaving them lying about, leaving the data lying about a great deal. Um, but in the third year, there's a tendency to think more seriously about data and where, what they were doing mostly when they thought about doing something, could do something, was putting their stuff as supplementary materials. I know you lot disapprove of that and I wanted to have some views. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess in some ways we disapprove of it, but we still allow it and it's a valid method of data sharing. So if um, the author is complying with three of our four policies, that is a way to be compliant. Um, we want to encourage uh, authors away from that because it's just so far from being findable and reusable. So yes, if you're reading the paper, you might come across the supplementary material, but no one else can. So if data is in a repository, it's open for anyone in that area of research to find it. Um, if it's in supplementary material, you, it's much less accessible. Um, also, of course, the file formats are pretty constricted, so you might find a spreadsheet that's now a PDF, and if you want to do something with that, what can you do? Scrape it, make it back into a spreadsheet. Um, so I think we're in quite a transitionary phase in terms of changing the culture. So. Um, 
like I've also been asked previously at conferences like why don't we make data sharing mandatory for everyone for every journal and I just think that researchers aren't ready um, but they uh, it's, it's becoming more common practice um, so over time hopefully we will move away from this idea of supplementary material but at the moment um, it's better than not sharing at all so we still uh, do allow it to happen and I would say what she said <laughs> thank you um, but I also think that we also are supporting things like Scholix that helps to link data sets to journal articles, citations, and looking at that um, model as a way so that people like to re um, publish within their own disciplines, and so they like to share the data with their own disciplines, and by uh, requiring it as supplementary material or as Rebecca said, it's just not as findable as if it's in a discipline-specific repository or an institutional repository. It has more capability of being found, but then the, the link with Scholix is, is given, so. Okay, um, and it was, there was one there, and then that one. Thank you. Sally Rumsey, University of Oxford. I'm just a little bit intrigued, actually, Jean, um, because Elsevier was a publisher and it now advertises itself as um, a global information analytics business. I'm just wondering what with now the Researcher Academy, where they're issuing certificates to researchers for taking various training courses, and now librarians and accredited um, librarian training, whether it's moving into being an educator as well. I've been asked that question, actually. Um, isn't this the role for professional associations to form um, educational programming? And I said, well, in the past, maybe that's what happened. But um, I, I'm bringing education component with my past experience to Elsevier. And we do have, a, as you mentioned, a researcher academy as well as this uh, RDM library and academy now. So Elsevier has worked with education before. They offer uh, a lot of webinars, Library Connect for librarians particularly. Um, so this is getting a little bit more formal in that if we do get a certification program um, approved by Simmons, then that will be something that could be put on resumes. But we've also worked with Scopus certification too. Colleen Delory and team have created a certification program for Scopus particularly. So yeah, I guess we, you know, we're moving in that area, but to me, when I heard about the data um, program, I was thinking, well, Elsevier, with their uh, information analytic experience, could contribute to this training program, too, and bring a lot of um, their experience to the table as well. So part of my dual role is working with the librarians, but I'm also working with an internal team to do training um, development for Elsevier as well. Okay, there was that question there. Chris Banks from Imperial College London. Um, thank you both for fascinating presentations. Um, I've got a quick question for Rebecca. Um, your, your slide of 2018 um, uh, queries, um, I want to go to the other end of that list. Uh, I noticed that copyright was one of the least um, queried and I wonder whether you think that that's because researchers understand um, all that needs to be understood about the copyright in the deposit of their data sets? That's such a good question because I don't know if you noticed on the slide I had of um, what people reported as being challenging. The, I think it's the third most reported is copyright. Um, and when I present that slide, usually I draw attention to it because I'm really surprised that so many researchers were aware of copyright enough to say that they weren't sure about what they should be doing. So I think um, we see it a lot as well with people who want the kind of hands-on curation. So they're sending us the data and they have to apply a license themselves. I genuinely, I think a lot of the time, they just don't know what they're being asked. So they choose a CC license and they don't know what CC means. Um, and I've previously, um, Fiona mentioned, I, I'm an open data trainer. So I've done a lot of training around copyright and licensing people outside libraries and publishers, they don't know what Creative Commons is. Like, the people are just choosing what's given to them, and I don't think they understand it. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions at this point? I have one then, which, which is, um, I mean, both your talks, um, I think rightly because of, of where you're coming from, uh, if you like, concentrated on how publishers are, are 
expanding their services and range, thinking about research data, and how librarians are, are also doing that and getting trained and, and you know, thinking outside their, their uh, like traditional skill set. Um, and this is to help researchers. I mean, should researchers themselves be taking more responsibility, do you think? Is there, is there, is there something that we, sh you know, we should we just, I don't know, leave them to it, but um, expect them, if you like, to, to also rise to that challenge? I think with the scalability issue, we're, we really do need to train the trainer kind of approach. And hopefully a lab will, if we're working with them as librarians, be able to learn and then be able to move forward um, until we can be funded to have a librarian per lab. We're not going to be able to sit there and do it for them all the time. You know, it's, it's partnering with them to learn initially, and then hopefully we could be part of the real research team. But I think it's the most exciting time for librarians right now because there is um, a lot that you can bring to the table that people don't know that you have as far as skills. And organization of anything anymore is really a key value. And I think that's what librarians can bring to the research lab. But, but the researchers, I hope, will also pick up some of this as well and be able to do best practices forward. Yeah, I, like as I was saying, like I think we're at a time of real cultural change because the policies that we have across our journals, the standard policies, it's only since 2016 that those have been standardized and rolled out. So I think researchers are still being asked to do something that they find quite new um, and maybe they're not sure how to do it. Um, so to give an example, uh, the journals that have a the type 2 policy that recommends that they include a data availability statement but doesn't require them to. Um, I did a quick assessment of one journal over time to see had researchers started adding this because it was recommended that they do and none had. Mm -hmm. So like they're still at the point where if they're not, uh, a lot of the time if they're not required to do something and they don't really understand what it is, they're not going to do it. I guess that also harks back to um, uh, some of the questions that we asked earlier in, the, in this, this meeting about um, what, what incentivizes researchers, or what incentivizes all of us, to be honest. But um, I guess if, if the incentives and rewards aren't, aren't perceived to be there, then it's not going to be a thing that people take, take time over. Yeah, and I think that's why we're trying to um, give more prominence. So, is my mic off? Oh, I don't think it is. So, we're trying to ensure that. Um, <laughs> trying to ensure that data citations are uh, equivalent to other types of citation in the reference list so that you do get credit if you share your data openly, your data are cited, you are added to references list and then you, you'll start seeing that impact. We're also doing a bit of research around um, if you have open data in your references list, does that increase citations of your actual paper? So there should be tangible benefits to researchers. I think as more um, compliance requirements for sharing data uh, come forth, that the fact that there's someone that can help them to have the data be presentable and not lost um, when the grad student leaves the lab will be really beneficial to them, um, however they share it. But I think what I'm hoping is that they feel more comfortable with collecting in an organized way their data and being able to share it then if they wish. So. Okay, um, I see there's another question, I believe that's the, no, we've got a bit more time. Um, hi, Toby Green from the uh, OECD. Uh, we've been publishing data uh, with DOIs and metadata and the whole lot for 15, 20 years now. The single biggest problem we have is that people will not cite data. It's not in their culture. They'll cite a journal article, they'll cite a book chapter, but they will not cite data, even though we've got a citation tool. So in your courses, are you teaching faculty and trying to get them to change so they will actually cite data just as they would cite a journal article? Because it's a massive frustration for us. That's a great point, and I'll be sure to make sure we, we cover that now. <laughs> Um, a bit of curriculum development though. Yeah, if we're still, if you have other ideas, I'd welcome them because now's the time because we're, we're formulating it, curriculum now, so. Okay, so, yep, in the middle. Uh, Martin Silkton, Taylor and Francis, just on that point, Toby, um, Clarivate are bringing data citation into their indexes now, so that, although there's a long way to go, might start to bring that incentive around it because it will start to be measured. Toby, could you make the point with the mic? The mic? 
Yeah. The, 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 the culture seems to be um, to you know, grab our data, turn it into a chart or a graph, stick it in the middle of a chapter or an article, and then they put, very helpfully, source colon OECD underneath it. Um, now, we publish 350 data sets. I challenge you to track one of our data sets from source colon OECD. It's really, really hard. And, um, and, and the, the just is, is, is a cultural thing. Um, I, mean, I challenge, I challenge our, our own researchers to put citations to our own data in our own stuff, and I still can't do it. Um, it's a really massive cultural issue. People just don't think that data should be cited for some reason, and it's, a, and it's going to take a very long uh, haul, I think, to, to persuade people that citing the data is just as valuable as citing a, a, a journal article or a, or a book chapter. I think adding to that, before I left the University of Utah, I worked with our promotion and tenure department, Academic Affairs, and encouraged them to think about how to reward faculty for data sharing and also for data citing. Um, so the more we can encourage our academies to recognize the value of it, I think the better, too. So. Okay, are there any other questions? In which case, I will um, just ask you to thank our, our speakers one more time. And then, yeah, go on. Um, and, and give me the, the welcome news that we'll be able to break a little bit early for lunch. I don't know if lunch is actually out there yet. But um, in any case, um, we'd like you to be back at 1.50 promptly. And in between times, um, can you spare a thought for, for Mosaic, who very kindly sponsored lunch? I think there was a slide. Is that? There we go. Yeah, so thank you very much, Mosaic, for, for lunch. Good, thank you. Thank you. That was a really, really interesting.